history professor in college, um, just a great all around historian, and a Civil War reenactor, which is super cool. Um, and he's going to be doing a program for us today talking about the battle at the, at the Pickett's Charge um, during Gettysburg. So we'll give us a, a little bit of a history of that and take it away to Robert. Well, thank you very much. I'm certainly delighted to be with you here this afternoon. You know, they sometimes say that uh, Shakespeare said, there's many a slip twixt the cup and the lip. Well, I was getting dressed to come up here, and I figured I wouldn't wear a shirt because you can't see it. And it's hotter than hell in here. Now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I can take anything off and still be decent. <laughs> well, two things before I get started. I'd like to thank uh, the library for having me here. I think it's quite an honor. And also, uh, we got a guy over there taking pictures. His name is John Dick, and he's taking pictures for his mother. And I'm dedicating this to her mother, to his mother. Her name is Margaret. She lives in Indianapolis. She's going to be 100 years old in a month or two. She's a civil war <laughs> And isn't he a great son to be here doing that? Well, I'm George Pickett, Major General, Confederate States of America, Army of Northern Virginia. Delighted to be here. I feel right at home, actually. You know, Florida was a Confederate state. And Lee County, you know who that's named after? Mm -hmm. Mr. Robert E. Lee. So I feel good about being here. I want to tell you, they, they, we never know, I guess, who, who's going to be here, how many people are going to be here. And uh, I'm from the South, and uh, you know we're, we're well churched in the South. And we like to be ready for anything. So I have sort of an all-purpose story for you. It is a church story. It's about this little country church way out in the country. They didn't, they didn't even have their own minister. So they had a visiting minister who came by every Sunday, usually a young man trying to make a name for himself. And this Sunday, the minister came, and he looked out into the audience, and there was only one person there, one. So he decided... He didn't know what to do, so he'd go to the guy and made him a co-conspirator. He said, I, I got a whole speech prepared, sir, and you're the only one here. What do you think I should do? He said, well, you know, I'm not a learned man of industries. I'm just a farmer. But I'll tell you this. If I went out to feed the cows and only one cow came up, I'd feed her. <laughs> <laughs> so he took that as a direction, and he went up and he gave his whole speech. And when he was done, 45 minutes later, all the fire and brimstone and so on, he went out to the guy and said, well, how'd that do? The guy said, hey, I don't know nothing about ministering. I'm just a farmer, but as a farmer, I will tell you this. If I went out to feed the cows and only one cow showed up, I'd be damned if I'd give her the whole load. <laughs> <laughs> well, we got enough people here today for the whole load. <laughs> I'm going to tell you why I'm here. There's an old saying that the first casualty of war is, anybody ever heard it? Yeah. First casualty of war is truth. And who writes the history of the war? The winners. The winners write the history of the war. So my wife and I, we are Thor in the South. It's not that we don't believe the Yankees are gonna tell the truth about the war. It's just that we wanna get our flag in there. We're talking mostly in the South. Sometimes we go into the North. But actually, we have a language culture there. The people in the North talk funny. Sometimes I, have a, I have a problem understanding them. Well, I'm going to say the first thing to you about, about what we call this war. The Yankees call it a civil war. And I suppose that's going to take hold. I mean, they won, didn't they? But actually, it was not a civil war. A civil war is a war between two peoples of the same country. We had our own country. Do we have our own country? You recognize that. Confederate States of America, right? So we call it the war between the states. That's okay, call it the war between the states. Sometimes I like to call it the war of Yankee aggression. But I'll tell you, I don't think that's going to fly. Because <laughs> it went. I'll tell you what, I got a little something that, it, that this isn't period. But like I say, it's warm in here, so I'm going to have a little sip every now and then. Now let's go back to the year 1863. 
Jefferson Davis was our president. Robert E. Lee was in charge of our military. Robert E. Lee, the best officer in the Northern Army, resigned his commission in the Army and went south. Now, everybody in the South understood that. Everybody in the South respected that. But some people in the North did not. Lee, by the way, was offered the chance to be the general of the Northern forces. But Lee left his home, which he loved, Arlington. And um, as soon as he left, the Yankees confiscated his property. It was totally against the law. They had, they had no, no reason why they could do that. Well, the reason was spite. Well, excuse me. Spite is, what they, is why they did it. Here's again, talk about the best laid plans of mice and men off go stray. Here you go, baby. <laughs> now, Arlington came to the Lees through Lee's wife. She was Martha Washington's granddaughter. She was Custis. She was also a Randolph, you know, now that we're talking Southern royalty and no question about that. And Lee and his family loved the plantation, so when they left, the Federals confiscated it, as I said, and they wanted to be sure he would never come back. So you know what they did? They started burying people there. They started burying Union soldiers who were flooded back to Washington. Pretty soon, Lee's front yard was full of graves, his backyard was full of graves in his fields. Pretty soon there were 20,000 of them there. And you know, it was a damn clever thing to do because you don't mess around with graves. So the Yankees eventually called it a national cemetery, Arlington National Cemetery. What I want to say is Arlington National Cemetery is hallowed ground. Comes from George Washington, goes to Robert E. Lee, goes right on. Now I do not approve of the way the Yankees took that land but I do approve of what they're doing with it. They're burying veterans there. And nobody deserves it more. So Lee comes back south, says he couldn't lift his hand against his native <coughs> Virginia. I can understand that. His father was Light Horse Harry Lee, in the uh, Revolutionary War hero, friend of George Washington. And as I mentioned, his wife was royalty. So when Lee got there, we started to win. By 1863, we had won a number of battles in a row. Second Manassas, which the Yankees called Second Bull Run, Antietam, Fredericksburg, Charlottesville. I'm going to tell you about that last one for just a, just a minute because it bears on what we're talking about. Did I, what did I say? Chambersville? Charlottesville. Yeah. Okay. Sure. And, <clears throat> well, in this battle, Lee was facing uh, Joseph Hooker. They called Joe Hooker Fighting Joe Hooker in the North. We had a different name for him. Also started with an F, but I won't tell you <laughs> in, the, in the library. But the fact was, that Hooker had a lot of women hanging around his camp, and he was noted for that. And people would ask, who are those women? And the answer was, well, they're Hookers. They're Hooker's women. <laughs> I think a guy could do worse than to have his name associated with the women who practice what some people believe is the world's oldest profession. But Hooker had a very bad day. Lee split his forces. We found out that the Yankee right was in the air. Now, I may, I may diverge here and there, because I think you've got to know this to understand it. His, his right was in the air. So here's your line. If you have nothing at the end of the line, the enemy can come and just roll it right up, you see. So at the end of your line, you gotta have a hill or a mountain or a creek or a river or something to keep people from coming in. But the Yankee writes in the air. So Lee sends Stonewall Jackson around, splits his forces. Booker already has more than he does. Splits his forces. And Stonewall comes around four o'clock in the afternoon, which it was sooner. And out of the woods to the right, the Yankees see coming out of the woods deer and rabbits and birds. What do you think's chasing all those things out of the woods? Yeah, Stonewall. Stonewall comes in, bam. Lee's greatest victory, they say. But the problem was, 
Stonewall, the aggressive son of a gun, he wanted more. He, he was going to make a night attack. He's out there riding around with his, with his staff looking for the Yankee lines. And some guys from North Carolina, they regretted it for the rest of their lives, you know. In war, you shoot first, you ask questions later, and they shot. And they hit Stonewall, left arm. Now, in this war, we used a rifle that had a rifle barrel. Caused the bullet to spin when it came out. You could hit something a mile away if you were from the south. Right? <laughs> you hit something a mile away. But this 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 bullet was called a mini ball. It had a hollow center, and when it hit something, it expanded. You know, and it would go in with a bullet this size, come out with a bullet that size, cause a lot of damage in between. And another big thing about the mini ball is whenever it hit stone, whenever it hit a bone, it would shatter it like glass. So if you were hit here, all they could do is cut it off here. So there were a lot of limbs that were taken uh, in this war. As a matter of fact, in some of the southern states, I think a good part of their budget was spent on artificial limbs. Too bad. Well, great stone wall died. Died. Now Lee said, Stonewall lost his left arm, I lost my right arm. And Stonewall was the tip of the spear. Tip of the spear. Lee never won an offensive battle again after Stonewall was gone. They played great defense. A lot of war to go, but we lost the tip of the spear. So Lee comes back after these victories and says to Jeff Davis, Virginia is eaten out. We gotta go north. Now let me tell you what he meant when Virginia was eaten out. An army would make a plague of locusts look good. You know, you if you take forty thousand men, they come and they they come by your property and they have guns and they're hungry and they they, they want to kill something. And you you could be a farmer there, you could have a farm, you could be an important person in your community. You might be on the library board or something like that. You know? <laughs> Helena, that's called a valentine. Still <laughs> early, but it's still called a valentine. An army comes through, and maybe they camp there. Well, they cut down your fences and use them for firewood. They cut down your trees and use them for firewood. They get everything edible, they take it away from you. And if it's an enemy army, they may burn down your house, break up your farm implements, Steal your horses, kill everything. Maybe relieve themselves in your well, just to show you how they feel about things. And you're standing out there the next morning, and you have nothing. I mean, you have nothing. You got your crying, crying wife and children holding your hand, and you have nothing to drink, you have nothing to eat, you have nothing to plant with. You know, that's what Lee meant by eat now. You know, I gotta say, Obviously, I, I have a certain side in this war. But the Yankees practiced something <clears throat> they called hard war. It was total war, total war. The idea is that you had some grandmother in Georgia who's knitting socks for her grandson who's in the Confederate Army. She's part of the war effort. Therefore, she's a legitimate target of war. That was Yankee philosophy. When I think of what Sherman did in his march that burned Atlanta, everybody had to leave, went up through South Carolina, 60 miles wide, the only thing standing were the chimneys. Waste. Generations of wealth totally destroyed. What they did to the Shenandoah Valley, Meade told Sheridan he wanted the Shenandoah pick so clean that a crow flying over would have to carry its own provender. And you know if a crow can't live there, people can't live there. This is war, this, this is the kind of war that the Yankees fought. Maybe it's one of the things that made us so dedicated because we were protecting our homeland, trying to have a country of our own. Well, in June of 63, Lee took us north. We had 60,000 veterans in top condition, undefeated. We had 150 cannon. 
We had 5,000 horse, and we had the best general on the continent headed north, and we knew there was no power on earth that could stand up to this army. And we kicked off, ready to go. We, we went marching through Pennsylvania. We could not believe what we were seeing in Pennsylvania. They had fruit on the trees. They had trees, for God's sakes, in Pennsylvania. Now, we had orders from General Lee. He said, take only what you need and pay for everything you take. Well, you know, it's an army in the main, we did that. Although I got to say, those Amish farmers, they did not like getting paid in Confederate money. <laughs> <laughs> but we told them, you just wait by and by. You'll be able to spend their money anywhere that you want. So we're marching north. We're looking for the Yankees. Our cavalry is out gallivanting around. Finally, we on the, on the, on the first day, July, a Union guy named John Buford, General John Buford, he comes over a rise near Gettysburg, and he sees off in the distance Confederate uniforms, and they're coming toward him. Well, he's got 2,000 mounted infantry with him, not cavalry, though, not those sissy cavalry, but mounted infantry. They know how to fight. And they had repeating rifles. And we used to say, you load those rifles on Sunday, and you can shoot them all week. So Buford strung his 2,000 out. Every fourth man goes back, pulls onto the horses. You know how that's how it goes. And they can see way off in the distance an officer by a bridge hitting the guys over the creek. One of Buford's guys took a shot at that officer. Didn't hit him, of course. Yankee in there. <laughs> and that was the first shot fired by the Gettysburg. So it was Henry Heath on our side. He presses. Buford resists. He presses, Buford resists. And all of a sudden, just like it comes to both of them at the same time, hey, this is, maybe this is the army. Maybe this is the other army. And they both send out messages, come quick. And that started hellish marches. Everybody wanted to get to Gettysburg quick. Because in this kind of kind of war, you, you, it was the firstest with the most. You know, you got there first with the most people, you, you would win. So that, that great march started. Now on the first day, I say we beat the Yankees. We drove them through Gettysburg, up on the hill, a couple of hills actually. The guy that was in charge of, of the Union Army, I'm just trying to think of his name. Now it'll come to me. Anyway, he, he gets shot in the neck. John something. Anyway, they open up his blouse to try to make him comfortable and they find in there a Catholic medal. People are figuring, what's, wrong? what's going on here? John Reynolds is his name. And he comes to me slowly. I'm, you know, my, you know, you all have a little sympathy, I sure. <laughs> so what's going on with John Reynolds and this Catholic medal? Nobody knows. Well, at John Reynolds' funeral, Young lady shows up around her neck. She has John Reynolds' class ring from West Point, class of 41. She said that she and John Reynolds were engaged, that she had given her love to John Reynolds. She would give it to no other. And she joined a convent, was lost to history. Well, Abner Doubleday took over for John Reynolds. Anybody here ever hear of Abner Doubleday? <laughs> yeah, the Yankees say he had been a baseball. <laughs> After Doubleday sends a message to me, the Fifth Corps ran on the first day. The Fifth Corps never forgave him for that. You know, these dispatches are written in ink. You can go to Washington right now and see every one of them. The Fifth Corps did not run. The Fifth Corps lost 8,000 men. And we began to think, well, these Yankees either are starting to learn how to fight or want to fight. They, they, they did pretty well that day. Toward the end of the first day, we had the chance to take them off that bridge. One of our generals was given an, given an order to go 
kick him off if he, if he thought feasible. He did not think feasible. His name is Buell. And we could hear axes working up there on that hill. They were building, they were building fortifications, you know. And I don't know whether any of you have ever seen these, these they're, they're logs about this big. They just pile them up head high, there's a little opening there, you put your rifle through, and then one on top. Once you build those fortifications, you're, you're going to be pretty safe. If we had Stonewall there on that day, you can bet your ass Stonewall would have been right up and taken that spot. The Yankees would have lost the high ground, which was a deciding factor in the war. And you know, here's, here's the difference. <laughs> one ounce of lead in the right place can have in a war. So on the second day, they're going to, the Yankees are up there on that fish hook. They're going to be writing books about the second day forever. You know, a little round top, the devil's den, the wheat field. Those of you who study, study about this, you, you, you know it. I want to talk about just, just one of those things, a little round top. General Warren, Union General, realized at the beginning of the second day that our right was right next to the little round top. He realized if anybody would get cannon up on the little round top, they would command the whole line. That little round top here, here's a line you could shoot any place along that line. So Warren got cobbled a bunch of group together, goes up there, General Longstreet, Realized the same thing about the same time. He sends General Oates up there with a bunch of Texans. Now, General Oates and his Texans have been marching for 18 hours, one of those death marches, everybody's trying to get there. His brother was killed the morning of. They were all thirsty, so he's on Big Round Top, which is right next to Little Round Top. He can see Little Round Top empty, but he's tired and thirsty, so he takes a 10 minute break, sends 16 men off for water. And when he gets to Little Round Top, the Yankees are there. And there comes a fight you wouldn't believe, kicking and punching and shooting and cutting and whatever. Eventually they got more men on Little Round Top than we did, and they kicked us off. And that happened a lot. They just, they just had more than we did. Well, on that day, there was a man named Strong Vincent who had a brigade, a northern brigade. Vincent, to me, is an example of the waste of war. You know, I say, I say good stuff about Vincent. I say good stuff about Joshua Chamberlain, people who deserve it. Vincent, strong Vincent, was a Harvard graduate. He was an attorney. Everybody loved him. Everybody thought he was going to be part of America as, as we developed as a nation. He left for the Army on his, the day he was married, by the time of, Gettysburg, his wife was pregnant. Now, I guess that's the truth. They say love will find a way, you know. I guess, I guess love, love did. But Vincent takes Joshua Chamberlain, he puts him on a little round top. He says, you were the left of the Union line. You were to hold this ground at all hazards. What did he mean? You're going to stay here or you're going to die here. That's, tell that to Joshua Chamberlain. You were, you were taking it to a guy who just take very seriously. Well, strong Vincent went off and and he was killed later. Joshua Chamberlain wrote some books after the war, which may be one of the reasons he's so well thought of. But he said, when strong Vincent died, his soul went to heaven in a chariot of fire. Now, isn't that a chariot of fire? And that's a nice way to put things. Well, here's Joshua Chamberlain. They called him the fighting professor. He was from Bowden College in Maine. And at Bowden College with Joshua Chamberlain, was a man named Calvin Stowe. Calvin Stowe was the husband of a lady named Harriet Beecher Stowe. You ever hear her? Of course you have. This is the library. <laughs> Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote the book that got the North ready to attack. She got them in the right mood. Propaganda. Uh, unbelievable propaganda. When Abraham Lincoln met Harriet Beecher Stowe, he said, so this is the little lady who started the big wall. Yeah. yeah. Well, Joshua Chamberlain now, he's a professor at Bowden College. He asked the board there for leave so he could go 
go and join the army. They said, well, hell no, you could get killed that way. We don't want you to, they wouldn't give him a leave. So he asked them for a leave to go to Europe to study religion. They gave him a leave and he joined the army. <laughs> so there he is. And I'll tell you, this isn't about Joshua Chamberlain, but if you want to read something, you read what he did a little round talk on that day. Eventually the Yankees got their cannon up there. They had to push the cannon up, it was too, too rough for horses. And once those cannons started banging away, the Yankees had a little round talk. At the end of the second day, Meade gets his leadership together. There are about 18 guys. They're in a little 12 by 14 room in a, in, in a, in a, a little cabin. He says, what should we do? All 18 of them said, stay here and fight it out. And it just amazes me that all of those Union officers, they understood about the good ground Robert E. Lee did not. So they decided to stay there and fight it out. Next morning, third day, it's tough to talk about. Lee goes over to Longstreet, says, I'm going to attack the Union Center. Longstreet looks up there, he says, General Lee, I've commanded men from companies, divisions, and I'll tell you this, no 15,000 men ever arrayed for battle can take that position. But General Lee said, the enemy is there, and there I will strike you. And you know what Shakespeare said? die is cast, and off we go. Now Lee had four parts of his plan, late getting going. They blame Longstreet. When the Confederate veterans have their reunion, they, they, they do not invite Longstreet. They blame Longstreet. First plan was to attack behind the Union Center, Culp's Hill, Culp's Farm, whatever hoping that uh, me would take men from the center, send them over there and weaken the center. But the Yankees attacked us, for Christ's sake, and that, 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 that did not happen. Second part, Lee sent Jeff Stewart, our cavalry, around our left, to cut the Emmitsburg Road. Now, wait a minute, cut the, it was the Baltimore Pike. Cut the Baltimore Pike. The, ba the Baltimore Pike, I'm going to mention the Evansburg Road. The Baltimore Pike was the way the Yankees were going to have to retreat if they were going to go back to Washington. Lee did not want them to retreat. Lee wanted to kill them all or take them prisoner. He wanted that off, that army off the board. So our cavalry goes around and who comes up? Greg in, with the Northern Cavalry led by a fellow named George Armstrong Custer. Have, 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 ever heard of him? <laughs> He's leading the 1st Michigan. Now, I don't know if you know about these numbers, but the 1st Michigan is the first group to join. So they were the strongest, the biggest, the most dedicated. So Custer's leading the 1st Michigan. He says, come on, you Wolverines. And those two clashed like two trains running into each other. My God. They fought for two hours and the Northerners drove us off. Northerners drove us off. Custer, was, Custer said it was the greatest battle in the annals of war. Well, I don't think Custer said in the annals of war, I don't know if you know what I think of Custer. <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, I heard he had some Indian problem later on. <laughs> okay. So part two didn't work. Part three, Lee was gonna bombard them with cannons. We had about 150. Porter Alexander, young overachievers, in charge of our cannon. So the bombardment starts. We start shooting, they start shooting. It was the greatest bombardment on the North American continent ever. They heard it 50 miles away. You know, our, uh, the veterans of these wars would say, after a great battle, the cannon, the next day it would rain. They, they thought the cannon did something about, about the weather. 
This noise I cannot convey to you was unbelievable. Men had blood run out their ears. People died a couple days later. Can't sound pressing. And the surgeon said they had internal injuries. Just from the pressing of the, of the sound. So we banged away at them, they banged away at us. Pretty soon the valley's full of smoke. And Alexander sends me a message. He says, you better be gone, because I'm almost out of ammunition. If you don't be waiting longer, I can't support you. So I go over to Longstreet and say, General, can we go? He couldn't say it. I think he was thinking of Fredericksburg. Fredericksburg. Longstreet was on good ground. General Lee came to him and said, can you hold here? And Longstreet said, if they attack me here, I'll kill them all. And now the shoe was on the other foot. So there comes a point when we got to go, the northern cannon had pulled back, and we thought they were out of business. General Hunt was in charge of the Northern Ten. So we come out of the woods. 12,500, 12,800, could have been 15,000. You know, a division had 5,000, but the other two divisions had been in the war already, and they had, and they had wounded men. And we lined up, first row, Second row, you put your arm out. Man out there, you touch his left shoulder, you shoot over his right. There you go. Third row, same thing. Third row is calling line closes. They had the ability to shoot anybody who turned around and ran away. You know, that's the way it is in the war. You gotta, if you fight the enemy, you might get killed. If you run away, your own arm is gonna give you a court martial and shoot you. So, better to go. So, we line up with the history of the North American continent in the balance. People up there on that hill, they're looking at us, they never seen any mile long, bayonets flashing in the sun, you know. Lee looks down, he sees wounded men in the line. Now, some of you guys are veterans, you know, you get wounded in battle, you've done your bit. You come back, they take care of your wounds, you get sent home and you march in parades for the rest of your life for the war hero. Well, our boys weren't going home. They were fighting for their country and they stayed and they were going up there again. But we stepped off and the Yankees, Yankee cannon came forward. They had some long range cannon with rifle barrel, barrels at that time. They had proximity fuses. Now proximity fuses you, you shoot a bullet, proximity fuse will tell you where it will explode. It will explode here. The, so they started to shoot over our heads. Bullets exploding over our heads. There's that damn thing again. Bullet, I got it there, I think. <laughs> I just need, don't have enough training. <laughs> bullets exploding over our heads, bullets exploding in the trees. And our men step off. We go pretty far, and the regular cannon and the Napoleon kick in. General Warren's firing from Little Round Top. He's firing into the side of our line. One shell brings down 10, 15 men. We keep on, we come to the Amherstburg Road, there's a fence there. Our boys climb over the fence. It should have been knocked down the night before, but nobody saw that, I guess. We brought them up, slowed them down, made them Target. We go a little further and over on the left, there's a group of Ohio boys, I think it's the 8th Ohio. They were seen out in front of the line the night before by some officer and they were forgotten about and they were still there. Well, they weren't our targets. We go marching by them, a couple hundred of them, they open up on us from our left. You can't miss. They're firing into our plane, you know. And our boys are going down and they just keep going. They just keep going. We get to the point where we're within rifle range, and there's, there's a unit up there, 
1,700 men, 10 cannon, 1,700 rifles holding their fire. You know, this fire, this is all hard to talk about. <laughs> yes, he does. It's his fire. And all those bullets hit a oh, man. And you could hear a oh, sound from that line as all those bullets hit. And still we came on. Get close enough, the Yankees started using canister. Now canister is a, it's a ball of sawdust with 42 balls in it. It's a bag of sawdust, double, triple canister. You'd have a row of men out there, they'd fire that thing. Bodies would go up in the air, parts of red mist <laughs> under the ground. There'd be nothing there. Well, we kept on going. We get to the wall. One of our generals, General Armistead, he said, we're, 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 we're trying for a group of three trees up there. Armistead gets over, gets his hand on a cannon, he gets shot. And just like all of our guys decided at the same time, they know they're either going to get captured or killed. So they turn around and start to run. The attack is over. The Yankees keep firing. They don't want to see us again. And then we face the most awful thing a soldier could feel, you know, being shot in the back, running from the enemy. My God, who wants that on your tombstone, right? So we get back. Our men clustered around General Lee. They want to go back. General Lee is saying, it's all my fault, it's all my, and it was all his fault. And to tell you the truth, I never forgave that old man for wrecking my division. I come riding by, I'm, I'm in shock. I've just seen a couple thousand of my men down that hill. I grew up with these men, some of them, some of them named, named their children after me. General Lee says, General Pickett, you must see to your division. I said, General Lee, I have no division. So we hunkered down that day Ready for a counterattack. The Yankees did not counterattack. Now Lee would have counterattacked. Stonewall Jackson would have counterattacked. Lee did. Lee did not counterattack. The next day it rained. See, I told you. The next day it rained. Next day we head south. Meade sends Lincoln a telegram. Lincoln slept in an old couch in the telegraph office. Says we have driven the enemy from our soil. And Lincoln says, they don't understand. It's all our soul. You see, that's the kind of steel that it took to win a war against people as determined as we were. Our wagon train of wounded was 15 miles long. You could stand there all day to see the flower of the South go by. Those men did not have sprained ankles. I told you about the mini ball, right? know what was in those wagons. The men were crying. You could hear it quite a ways away. The men were crying. Some men were begging to be shot. Well, the next day, we were, we, we were stuck there because the river was up. But the next day, we went south. They called that the hot point of the Confederacy, and it was. On the 4th, Grant took Vicksburg, split the Mississippi, split the Confederacy in two. You know, there was a lot of fighting to do. It was all over. It was all over. <laughs> well, I'm just about going to end up here. Let me, let me, I just want to say a couple things to you. Number one is I do not take questions after this talk because I want the last thing you hear to be my voice, and the last thing you remember is what I'm going to tell you now. You know, we get up, people in the future get up, go about their business, and they think this is natural. You know, all this freedom, all this success. 
There are a lot of sacrifices made. People gave it to us. So there's two things I want to hope maybe it'll do. Maybe try to figure out who did what made this country possible. I think it's, it's ungrateful to not do that, to just enjoy it, take it like, like you earned it, because you didn't earn it. Somebody else earned it for you. So I think we should all study history to know who we are. And second, I can't tell you how to do this, but I hope you try to be worthy. Be worthy of what we've done for you. Okay, thank you. That's it.